systems. We've been working with uh, Hadoop and HBase uh, since uh, 2008, and since about uh, 2009 and early 2010, using it in production. And uh, this talk will go through our uh, OLAP solution, simple OLAP solution that we build on top of these technologies. So uh, we're going to explain a little uh, what we're trying to solve. The term OLAP is uh, very well defined. It has a lot of literature, a lot of people actually researching it to a much deeper level that, uh, than what we're trying to solve. However, ours, uh, I, we think it's, a, it's an OLAP system nonetheless, but it's just a, a subset. So we're trying to explain what exactly we're trying to solve. Uh, then we're going to go to the, through a description of the entire system. Hopefully this, is, this will be a more engineering, uh, like this talk will contain more engineering details. And we'll, we'll go layer by layer from the top level view to internally to see how it works, uh, how we're using Hadoop, HDFS, MapReduce, and HBase, and what we're doing to, to minimize latency. So in, an, in a nutshell, we have this low latency OLAP system which uh, uses Hadoop DFS to store input data like log files. Uh, the processing loop of the system, it's built using some MapReduce jobs, which uh, basically take a, take a cube description, and uh, we process it by pre-aggregation using Hadoop MapReduce, uh, storing the results into a statistics output HBase table. Afterwards, uh, users interact with the system by querying a uh, server which basically scans these HBase tables, applying the filters, roll-ups, drill-downs, any kind of uh, simple OLAP operations that you can think about, and returning the result. Be be before we move on, uh, it would be interesting to see a show of hands. How many of you here have worked with the uh, SQL? Okay, that's great. And OLAP systems? Still great. Uh, what about, I know most of you have worked with Hadoop since you're at the Hadoop Summit, but what about HBase? How many of you have been running or working with HBase? Okay, so basically I'm gonna move, move really fast through this uh, with this uh, vocabulary that we're trying to explain, and I'm only doing this because these terms will come up uh, over and over again during my presentation. So basically, uh, we, have, uh, we have a set of input data like uh, web analytics files or sales events or any kind, of, any kind of data. And this data basically you can split into two big parts. Basically you get numeric data which are metrics or measures like sales or number of visits. Uh, and, and this data is tagged, with a set, is tagged with a set of metadata or labels. And these, these are called dimensions. Uh, these characterize our data and put it into a bucket or, to on, on, or another bucket. Time, uh, time is a dimension or any other, any other uh, metadata your, uh, you know, your, your rows or your events can contain. Basically what you want to do is answer all kinds of questions which all boil down to a fundamental operation of viewing the metrics by any combination of dimensions. Uh, here's uh, some simple examples, since you're, most of you are familiar with SQL, about some simple OLAP queries that we can do, like rollups. Rollups basically decreases the cardinality of your data. Having, uh, I don't know, uh, 50 sales events, if you only consider a couple of dimensions or only one, like the country, you can roll up and sum or count the rest of uh, these rows, which uh, essentially become one. Uh, another type of uh, really important operation is slicing. Basically, what this, uh, what this, what slicing means, it says, take my data, discard any kind of rows which don't fit into a certain pattern or where a dimension doesn't have a certain value, and with the rest of the data, apply the same operations like rollups or just getting it. Another uh, really, really important operation that uh, users usually want to do is they want to, to, to order the data. And why do you want to do that? Because you want to see which country you have the most, uh, you know, you, in which country you sell the most, basically. Now let's go and uh, take a look inside the system, layer by layer, and see how, how it looks like. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. And once we go down, uh, start, things will start uh, becoming a little bit more complicated. But basically, our system is running on an unusual Hadoop and HBase cluster, which we collocate for data locality on the same machines. So you've got a cluster of 10, 15, 20 machines using, uh, you know, running Hadoop data nodes, test tracker, name nodes, job tracker, uh, HBase region servers. Uh, then our software comes on top of it as a, as a MapReduce job. 
and the query server component, which uh, tip, uh, users typically query through a load balancer to get back the analytics results. Now, how, how do users interact with the system and what's actually going on? This is the entire data, uh, well, simplified data flow of data through our system. Everything starts with uh, users creating uh, what we call a reports definition. This is basically like an OLAP cube specifying, uh, specifying what questions you want, uh, you want to answer to. Uh, this is encoded as a simple JSON file which contains, uh, again, these concepts of reports, dimensions, and metrics. Uh, data comes into a system, uh, you know, that's through, through an external process, which we, we won't go in about here. Uh, our system can handle either, uh, either simple basic log files or Hadoop input files, or more often we uh, use HBase as a data warehousing mechanism. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail later on why we do that. Uh, the process, then uh, once, the, once data is in the system, uh, we have uh, the MapReduce job, the processing job, which we call the super processor, which basically takes this entire data set or a part of it, pre-aggregates it, and writes it to a statistics output table. Then users, as I said, use the query server, which uh, basically scans this table to, to get the data. Why, why, why does this work? What's the fundamental uh, simplifying assumption that we make which works in, uh, in most of the cases that we've, uh, we've, we've met? In most of the cases, you need to summarize the data. Uh, you don't need to look at one billion, two billion, three billion data points at any one time. Also, if you, ha if you have a really rich uh, event set with a lot of dimensions and uh, you can split it any which way you want, uh, you, you, you don't uh, usually need to look at all the dimensions at the same time because any change uh, in the system will make uh, things very, very hard to correlate. You get rid of one and the rest uh, set of big dimensions will skew your data and you, you won't be able to get any, any, any intelligence, any understanding out of it. And finally, not all queries are used with the same frequencies. This, this is really, really important. What we typically see is that users have a set of uh, uh, queries that uh, they use all the time, which mu must run really quickly, and the set of queries that they use for you know, data to, to, to inspect the data and see what's going on, but those are typically not used with the same frequency. So that leads us to, uh, to a problem that comes up uh, in all areas of computer science. If you think about uh, the user's experience, you can either, either optimize the, the time the user has to spend uh, getting back results from an analytic system uh, or the space, and each one comes with its own uh, set of plus and pluses and minuses. Um, in most cases, if, you, if uh, we want to optimize time, we, we uh, apply this operation of pre-aggregation, which basically reduces the cardinality of your data set by orders of magnitude. Uh, which leads to really, really fast queries and efficient reads, which are basically independent of the size of the initial data set. But it's also pretty inflexible and you get the latency added by the processing layer and you get a combinatorial explosion in some cases. What does that mean? The combinatorial explosion is uh, what happens when, uh, when you have dimensions which have uh, a, a huge number of values like tags. If, for example, if you think about delicious, uh, the set of tags in delicious. If that were one of your dimensions, you'd have a huge set of uh, of dimensions, a, a, huge, a huge set of pre-aggregated rows. On the other hand, uh, you know, just you can just query the initial data set, and that's the most flexible that you can get. But it's uh, really, really uh, I/O and CPU intensive because, uh, in in the worst case, you basically need to scan through the entire data. So we. Why don't why not do uh, do both? Uh, our system uh, users of our system can choose whether they want to tune, they want to pre-aggregate more and get rid of a lot of dimensions for some really fast queries, or add more dimensions to the uh, pre-aggregated data, which basically will translate to exactly the same as runtime aggregation. Basically, this works in a, in a SQL database or a relational database exactly like normal SQL queries. If you want to optimize them, just create some materialized views. So what's our solution? This is, this is basically the, uh, the, what's, what's happening in inside the entire system. In the processing step, we pre-aggregate all the report definitions that we know beforehand, and we create an indexed HBase table. Then at query time, we use the indexes to get to the data fast, and we can also perform extra aggregation or roll-ups uh, or slicing at runtime. 
doing this, we, uh, I'm sorry, doing this, we use exactly the platform strength, which is uh, pluralism, which is given to us by Hadoop MapReduce, and fast access and natural key ordering in HBase. Uh, to just for if, for those of you who ha haven't used HBase, this is uh, some really minimal detail, so we can so you understand what's going on. Basically, in HBase, uh, HBase is the Hadoop database is a columnar data store uh, where data is uh, stored in tables. Uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, each row has a key and any number of columns. This is really, really important. So think about uh, HBase as like a quasi-infinite Excel table. So uh, tables can be both long and wide, which is really, really important if you want to group some events and store them on a single row. Also, the most fundamental property of, uh, of HBase is that uh, clustered indexes uh, are built in. Uh, inside a table, uh, the, uh, the rows are ordered in an absolute order by the row key, lexicographically by the row key. Uh, if you insert new data and uh, then you, you, you get it back from HBase, it's going to return the rows in exactly the, the, uh, the, the order of the row key. Uh, finally, the, as I said, it's like an Excel table, but tables are sparse, so basically you don't need to store null values. Uh, a column that doesn't exist, that's a null value. It's, um, uh, the, the, well, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that, but at, at the core, uh, operations, most operations use the row key. So you can either uh, get some data from a row or put some data to a row, and these, uh, these functions both, uh, both use the row key to identify the row. Another fundamental operation is you can scan a range of rows. Uh, why does this make sense between a start row and an end row? Why does this make sense? Because the rows are, again, are ordered by the row key. So that means if there's an ordering relation, we can say start from row AA and get me all the data until row uh, BC. So, you know, the, the first thing that you think about is that why don't we use the row key as a built-in indexing mechanism? Here's, for example, uh, again, this will be really, really familiar to those of you that know SQL, uh, about what a, what a SAS base, that's, that's how our system is called internally. I wanted to call it Panthera, but didn't, didn't come up. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a SAS base, what we call a report, as compared to a, to a SQL query or a materialized view. Basically, you specify the same, the, the exactly the same things. You can map them one, uh, one to one with the SQL query. You've got dimensions, which uh, represent your, uh, the elements in your group by clause. And then you've got metrics, which are uh, stuff that you want to select. And the dimensions uh, also, uh, you can select them. Uh, you have what we call transport dimensions, which don't impact the data in any way. You just want to attach them to, to the output results. And uh, finally, you can specify some, um, uh, some, some sorting uh, using a specific metric or dimension. Um, the having or where clauses are not specified here because uh, in, in this step, when we create the reports definition, we don't know exactly what we'll want to query. So that's all done at runtime. So again, and this is uh, really, really important, uh, the, same, the, same, uh, the same concepts come up uh, over and over again. Uh, the reports configuration is, uh, is the central part of our system. It's used all the components in the system, the import step, the process step, the query step, load the set of reports configuration uh, and, and use it to make sense of, uh, of the input data. Uh, the reports configuration, it's, it's pretty simple. It contains a list of dimensions, a list of metrics, and a list of reports which, uh, which basically have this format, containing the same dimensions, a subset of dimensions, a subset of metrics, and eventual sorting. Uh, also, uh, apart from this report configuration, users can choose to implement and override their own dimension and metrics classes. And uh, this turns out to be a really, really handy mechanism of injecting some flexibility into the system. Uh, Again, we'll, uh, we're going to spend a little bit more time here. So what's our solution? Basically, this is, this is the, uh, if I could end the presentation after this slide, that, uh, that, that, would, pretty, uh, that would basically be it. Uh, what's the solution? Given a set of input data, which you know, contains some metrics like sales, which are tagged with some metadata like dimensions, like date or country or city, and, oh, that's not right. <laughs> 
And given a set of reports which are overlapping a bit, but given two reports, uh, one of which groups the, groups the visits by city, by country and city, and the other one, uh, you know, gives us the total sales value for, uh, you know, uh, for a certain day and a certain country, uh, what this amounts to after the processing loop, we will fill uh, the statistics uh, age base output table with, uh, with some rows that look a little bit like this. And I'll go through and explain what's going on. Uh, basically, what this does is pretty simple. For, for, for all the input rows, for all the reports, uh, take uh, each report's definition, uh, group it using only the specified dimensions and metrics, uh, then write uh, an H a row in an HBase table which contains uh, something like the report identifier, then the list of all the dimension values, uh, and finally, just uh, j just add up and write the metrics to um, to a column in the in the statistics table. Why why does this work? So what's what's going on? At uh, how can we use that? Uh, again, uh, because the rows in uh, in an HBase table are ordered in a, in a natural order, uh, that basically gives us a built-in uh, hierarchical filtering mechanism. So. For example, if you've got something like a date dimension, which is composed of year, month, and day, and then you've got the country and the city, let's say I want to look at all the data uh, in 2012. Well, that's simple. That translates immediately to a simple HBase scan, which just says, get me all the rows that start with 2012. Uh, the same, let's say you want to drill down and look for the month of May. The same thing, just create a, a new scan that uh, says get me all the rows that begin with 2012 slash or another separate at 05. And, uh, and again and again and again, for all the dimensions in your reports, you can, you can filter and do roll-ups or slice to any level that you want uh, given that you have specified the dimensions beforehand. So uh, this, this property of HBase, of having the rows ordered by row key, it's, uh, is really, really important. That's, that's, basically, uh, that's basically the core of the system. Uh, we can use and set uh, dimension values which translate directly one-to-one -to, -one to HBase scans. What about sorting? That's, uh, as I said, that's another really, really important operation. You want to see which country uh, have made the most money for your, uh, you know, your, your online shopping system. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty easy. We can use the same mechanism. Uh, we only added dimensions to the, to the row key up until now, but uh, what you need to do is simply add all the metrics that you want to sort by to the row key uh, in a way that reserves the ordering. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, order by desk that, that pretty much gives you a, kind of like a top query, like give me the countries where I made the most money. Uh, to do that, you need to encode the, the metric uh, with the, with the well, there are other formulas, but one that works really well is, for example, having max value minus the value of the metric. And uh, when, you, when you represent this as a string, it's going to sort lexicographically in, uh, in descending order automatically. Okay, now let's go, th uh, let's go through all the components of the system and see what we're doing to, to minimize latency. Uh, latency is, uh, is the absolute killer in an, uh, in, an, uh, in an analytic system. All of your users, all of our users at least, have asked us what's the latency until I get some results. Uh, what do I mean by latency? Latency is uh, the total amount of time uh, until an event is born somewhere, whether a user clicks on a web page or uh, you know somebody starts up a Photoshop touch on their tablet or some other event happens in some uh, some place somewhere until until a user that 's interested about that event uh, can see it uh, can see it and um, you know answer some questions about it uh, if you think about it uh, and you know uh, usually what we see um, you can split the, the latency into these, uh, into these components. You, you've got an import latency until, uh, you know, since the events are generated into a system, until they get ingested into, into our processing system, that's usually a latency. If you can get rid of it altogether, that's fine. But, you know, you have to account for it. The other one is, you know, until uh, the events are in the system, in a 
HBase warehouse table, then they get picked up by the processing loop for pre-aggregation. That's another latency. Then while the pre-aggregation loop runs, that's yet another, uh, another time that increases the latency. And finally, you, again, we can choose to have really, really fast reports uh, by pre-aggregating uh, pre more or have more complex reports which let user delve in however they want but then you would have a considerable query latency because you would have to scan a lot of data. So when you talk about minimizing latency, we have to look at minimizing each of these components. Uh, to minimize the import latency, uh, the, the best way to, to minimize any kind of work is not to do that work at all. So basically the most important thing we, we can do is not import data that's already in the system. So uh, what that means, or, or only import the minimal set of changes. Uh, basically here we use some, uh, some uh, custom MapReduce input filters if we, use, uh, if we use log files for input, or we just use um, uh, some, we specify start and stop rows for the uh, data warehouse HBase uh, table input scan. Uh, this is really interesting. We have, uh, we have, we we have a couple of uh, input filters uh, for MapReduce, which basically they work together and they say, uh, they give you a result which looks like process files from a certain uh, date range only once. What does that mean only once? We have all kinds of integration. Integration is a big part of our system and we have all kinds of your cases where we have uh, log files which are not rolled and are updated every time so that we actually copy them and, but the log files are live. And new data is actually being written to the log so we need to see whether that uh, log has been modified or not using for example a, a checksum, a control checksum. Um, another thing that's really important is that um, usually there are two antagonistic uh, ways that you can optimize the system. You can, you can either optimize it to um, to work fast for incremental updates, incremental processing, or you can uh, you know, optimize it to run really, really well uh, for, huge, for huge input data. So for example, we have clients which say, yeah, that's fine, uh, your, your system is awesome. How, how, about, how long would it take me to uh, ingest and process my five years worth of uh, log data, like petabytes of log data? <laughs> And uh, to optimize for that, uh, one of the most important things we can do is uh, minimize map task overhead. What does that mean? We have use cases where we have to uh, ingest or process a huge amount of files at any one time, like 400,000 files, 500,000 time files. It would be uh, too much to rewrite them into a format or a form that's good for HDFS. HDFS is really good at dealing with bigger, uh, 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 so less files which are bigger than you know, a, a huge number of small files. Um, by default, uh, Hadoop MapReduce, if you give it, uh, if you cr run a job with 400,000 input files, it's going to create 400,000 map tasks, which will basically, uh, if, you, if you run a MapReduce job on that, uh, like 80% of your time will be spent in the reduce copy phase when the results are copied to the, to the reducer. Uh, so what we do here, both for, uh, for log files and for H-based warehouse uh, format, uh, is uh, we, we stitch multiple input splits, whether they be files or H-based regions, H-based regions uh, into, the same, uh, into the same map task. Uh, that's a, another really important thing. Uh, H-based by default, you can use it as a live system so you can write data to it. But again, for the, for the use case of huge, huge bulk imports, uh, you, you need to use H-file output format. What this is, it's a, it's a Hadoop MapReduce output format that basically creates, uh, creates exactly the, the same data files that HBase would normally create during its operation. So basically, uh, you say to HBase, here's a table load it up and, and use it. It's already written, the data is already there in the format that you need. You don't have to do anything else to it. That's about uh, from 100 times to 1,000 times faster than, uh, than pushing data using the API. Which, which uh, and if you do that, that, that presents its own set of interesting, uh, interesting problems. Uh, the first and foremost is uh, there is no shuffle steps. So you have to use in your MapReduce job a global order partitioner. Uh, 
which uh, solves the problem, which means the data will be sorted for each base when it loads it. But on the other hand, uh, it, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit against to how uh, uh, the real world, uh, uh, real world runs because the data grows over time. So uh, if you're using uh, something simple like uh, only the date to estimate the output partition, so for example, to say if you want to import uh, two years of data, I'll just create 365 times two regions, uh, so one region per day. But the problem with that is that the beginning regions will have like uh, 50 megabytes of data, whereas in the end, you will have huge regions like five gigs of data. So uh, another thing that we, we've worked really hard on is uh, having a way to estimate output partitions based on input data size. That's uh, usually a pretty good heuristic because if, you have, uh, if you're doing warehousing, uh, the more data you ingest, the more data you're gonna write. And if you ingest like, um, you know, uh, uh, five, uh, five gigabytes of data for a single day, then it makes sense to create uh, two HBase regions for that day, not only one. So for that, we have uh, the file size date partitioner, which basically communicates with the, uh, with the input filters. And what the input filters do is they let the files come into the Hadoop map reduce computation. And as a side effect, they write the, the, the size of these files and the name of these files into an HBase table. This HBase table is then queried and injected into this uh, partitioner so we can rebalance regions based on, uh, on the actual file sizes. Uh, okay, so that, that was import. Let's move to processing. So again, what, what does processing do? Just, just the simple stuff that I showed, it just creates an index stage based table with everything we need in it. So that involves reading the input, uh, whether it's files, tables, or events from another system, pre-aggregating them and generating the tables. Uh, if you want to think about uh, a SQL operations, that does group by um, eventual aggregate functions and ordering. Uh, that's uh, the processing in our system is implemented as a single map reduce job. To minimize that, again, you have to split it by pieces and minimize each map reduce step. Read, map, shuffle, reduce everything. Uh, for reduce, uh, for, for reading data, again, uh, how, do you, how do you minimize work? You simply don't do it. So we've spent a, a lot of time doing what we call incremental processing. W what does incremental processing mean? Basically, if you think about something like uh, visits on a website, uh, visits last for, uh, for a single day, right? So once you do processing for up until a week ago, there's no way that new data that comes into the system could affect the analytics that were built for uh, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. So what that means is you don't need to reprocess that entire data set. But uh, you need to have a way of differentiating between open and closed data. Open data meaning data which could influence your current analytics pre-aggregations. Of course, we use uh, all the HBase uh, scanning options like caching and batching, so we, uh, make, we minimize the number of round trips to the HBase region servers. And, uh, and finally, before processing, we, we ensure that HBase table regions are uh, evenly distributed inside the cluster. Uh, the superprocessor that's actually called the superprocessor class uh, it's a one-shot map reduce job. Again, what the processing loop does is like, uh, it's just like a game in a loop for all the data, for all the reports, emit all the pre-aggregated values inside a single map reduce call. Uh, I, I wouldn't show you the code even if I could because it's, it's, it's ugly. It pretty much reads like C code. Uh, there are no allocations inside this map reduce job. Uh, it's, uh, it's retardedly simple. Uh, there, are, there are no system calls, there's no logging, there's, we, have, we have some very intricate mechanisms of detecting errors inside this MapReduce job because there we can't have any logging. Uh, there are no transformations anywhere. Everything is used either byte buffers or byte arrays. Uh, we store data into arcane representations between the map combined and the combiner reduce steps to minimize the I.O. each step of the way. Uh, and again, there are no memory allocations inside, inside this job. Um, it's, uh, it's built to be really, really, really fast. Uh, it might take a long time for, uh, for, 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 uh, you know, for smaller clusters, but by what I mean by fast is basically we want it to run as close as possible to, to how a bare metal program would run. Uh, what about query latency? Well, that's, uh, again, that's, uh, 
that's another really interesting problem. We have a simple thrift server, which is called the, the report server, uh, which users query to get the data and they get back something like JSON results. Uh, th there's not much to do here. Uh, data is already processed or pre and pre-aggregated in most cases. Of course, you do have the use case where you have huge number of uh, dimensions in a single report, so that's gonna take, uh, that's gonna take some time. Uh, related to, to, a, to a SQL vocabulary, at QueryDime we do a filtering or slicing like where clauses and extra group by. So what does that mean? Um, uh, if you have a pre-canned pre report definition using five dimensions at query time, you can only request three of those. So that's going to get all the rows, uh, discard the two dimensions, and then roll up the, uh, the rows that, are, uh, that aren't distinct anymore. Uh, this is a really interesting problem. Uh, what, what, the, what the query server does is calculate an optimal set of H-based scans. Um, what does optimal mean? Well, in some cases, we might decide that uh, we'll do a single scan and then discard a bunch of rows from that before doing the calculation. In other cases, we want to do like 50 small scans to, uh, and then use all of the results in those uh, using the slices and uh, uh, using the, the where filters, the, the queries that the user specifies. Uh, this report server creates the prefixes and uh, you know, creates some scans with starts and stop rows. There's, uh, again, there's a lot of, uh, of, uh, of stuff that we're doing to, to, to minimize data. Um, of course, it can perform extra roll-ups and sorting. Uh, in conclusion, uh, this, is, this is pretty much what we built. The most, uh, you know, the most, uh, I guess, the, the most important thing is that uh, the report configuration is in the core of the system. The query server, the MapReduce job, the super processor, or are really, really, really thin layers. Uh, all, the, all the functionality is actually delegated to, the, to these dimension and matrix classes, which the user can override completely. Uh, they can override serialization or aggregate function. You can have metrics which are actually alive, metrics or dimensions which are actually alive, like only return the value one if, if something, if, if an event has a certain property and zero in all other cases. So, um, uh, you know, as soon as we see our user, uh, our users uh, having emergent patterns, like for example, um, what do you call them, averages, uh, they were implemented by a user and then we integrated it into our system using those uh, uh, custom uh, definitions. Uh, it's really, really flexible because then you don't have to duplicate the code to move everything out of MapReduce. Uh, we're experimenting right now with uh, real-time analytics where the entire processing loop uh, is using Storm for processing, not MapReduce. Uh, <clears throat> we're running in production with about uh, five clients right now. Of course, there's a still a lot of more work to do. I haven't talked anything about productization, operations, uh, and, uh, you know, there's still some programming required. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, hopefully, I had enough time to, to go through the entire system. Uh, for more details, uh, just go to our website or send me an email, and I do think we have time for some questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, and actually, that's interesting, the way you arrange the row key. I mean, I was wondering whether you explored anything about the secondary indexes, I mean, for the metrics and the dimensions. Uh, yes, we are, we are exploring that uh, more. Uh, so the question is if we are exploring something related to secondary indexes. And the, the answer is yes, we are exploring that using the new uh, coprocessor functionality that's, uh, that's in age base right now. So basically the, the way we think about it is like moving some, uh, some, some secondary indexing, like for example for sorting, uh, inside uh, an age-based coprocessor, which uh, which writes its internal age-based table, so we don't need to query it to 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 worry about anything. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question uh, was uh, whether omniture data is stored like this, or it's in a different system. Omniture data is in uh, is in a different system. Uh, we were already in production with some of our use cases when, uh, when we acquired Omniture, and uh, we are talking to them for, for some use cases, but, but right now they, they, have, uh, they, they have their own stuff for the moment. Hi, uh, I have a couple of questions. The first is the data volume. 
So on the on the reports you're currently running on your system, on the biggest one, the, uh, I'm take the biggest one example on how many rows are stored for that report in the HBase side. Yeah. So for example, for a, for a web analytics system that contains a table about uh, 400 regions, which translates to about uh, 800 billion uh, visits. So that's visits, not individual hits. Each visit contains more hits. The, the, uh, the statistics table is aggregated uh, to about uh, 20, uh, 10, 10, 15, uh, 10, 15 regions. Uh, I, I don't have anything more uh, so more specific than that. So it really reduces the the the, the size of the output. So when you say the statistics table, you mean the pre-aggregation yeah, table? Yeah, the pre-aggregate okay. table. Uh, so the second question I have is, uh, uh, you mentioned in the processing step, you uh, launch a MapReduce job to pre-aggregate the data. And uh, after that, you have a query issued by the client to query on the pre-aggregate data. Is that still a MapReduce job? or? No, no, that, that's an actual server that just goes to, goes to the HBase table and serves the, the data live from the, from the pre-aggregated table. So uh, what's batch is we, we write pre-aggregated results, but at query time, everything is done in, in real time, basically. Okay, so both the map reduce job and the processing step and the, and the, and the, and the query uh, from the query server, they both use the scan as the fundamental operation to hit the HBase. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, the pre-aggregate, the MapReduce jobs mostly does writes, uh, write into the HBase table. The, the the query scan does reads by scanning by scanning the output table. Okay. And so one last question. I'm sorry. The, so uh, the first step is import step. You import the data from the clients, and how often uh, you import the files from the clients? Okay. So in uh, in our current uh, most advanced production use case, uh, we uh, we import data. Uh, every every two or three minutes, then the processing loop takes over, and it's another uh, uh, four to five minutes. So basically, we we currently have something like a eight, nine, ten minute latency uh, for a, for a web analytics. Okay, system. so then how you manage compactions? I'm not sure. I for example, the once you load data every ten minutes or every ten minutes, so there will be new files. Or for, for example, you have one hundred regions, there will be yeah. Uh, 100 files, how we manage well, well the, the, Yeah, yeah, well, well, the, yeah and that's, I think we have another question here. The, the, the really shortly, the way we do it is uh, we, in, the, in the warehousing table, we use the, the date as, the, as the, the beginning, the fundamental the beginning of the row key. So that means we won't write data spread into all the regions, just a couple of hot regions at the end. So we can, we can handle the, the splitting and the compactions for, for those couple of regions every couple of minutes. Thank you. Christopher Dean, I, I wondered if you ever had cases where data corruption or whatever that made you have to roll back, like two months ago, someone said, oh, that data I gave you, that was junk, please, here's the good data. Yeah. What do you, what do, you do then? And we cry. We cry. <laughs> um, we, we, we cry like little girls, and then we, we just reprocess everything. Uh, that's another thing that, oh, yeah, that's, I'm sorry. What we usually do, but that's like more like an operational detail. Always try to keep the initial input data. That will allow you later to clean it up or, uh, or fix it into some way or re-import it into the warehousing layer and you know, have, some more, have, some more, uh, have some more stuff that fixes it into. Do you have a manual, pro do you have a manual process where you delete um, you know, the aggregate data and then you just rerun yes, it? Yes, we can, we can delete. It's not, well, it's, it's manual. We can delete aggregate data for a report or for any combination of report and dimensions, just like the query. Just instead of query, you delete. That's cool. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry, you. So what, what bottlenecks are left? What bottlenecks are left? <laughs> That's uh, uh, real time, real, real time. That's what we're focusing on right now. I mean, not, not minutes, seconds. Uh, five seconds is too much for some of our clients. So that's what we're working on right now. Uh, oh, inside the system, you mean like uh, in, at the physical level? Uh, the, the one we've optimized and that's uh, bitten us in the S up until now was, uh, was uh, I.O. and networking, disk and, disk and networking, basically. We haven't had you know, money or time to experiment with stuff like SSDs. Uh, we typically run uh, uh, small clusters of super beefy machines because that's, that's what we can get due to budgeting and stuff like that. So that, that's what's been uh, biting us.
I'm sorry, could you? So the super processor is pretty agnostic. If you give it three years worth of data, it's going to pre-aggregate those three years worth. Uh, if you give it a two. But you look at data for the last three minutes. Yeah. And you aggregate it again, so you got data and you just Yeah, that's, that's the thing. We don't need to do that. Well, actually, what we do every couple of minutes, we, uh, because the, the, it's, it's a web analytics system and the visits close every, every three days. So what we do is we process three days behind. Uh, other than that, it can't possibly affect the older analytics data. Uh, we store the output in a, in a window table and then ju just use both tables to do the queries. Uh, I think one, one last question. So uh, do you support uh, low or low No. That's uh, non-edible measures. Uh, yeah, that was something that we've worked like uh, uh, half a year to, to figure out how, uh, how we, we can do it. It's a really, really hard problem. We're not solving it correctly. We're solving it, I think, as well or as bad as anybody else. We use uh, stream counting uh, for, for something like unique users. We, we lie, basically, like uh, what's, what's unique, daily unique. Uh, daily unique is not unique. That's, uh, uh, fortunately, we haven't had to do more advanced use cases. We do have some uh, experiments that can fix this issue, but uh, it's, uh, it's still a long ways and uh, we still need to work on it. Okay, I think that's, I, that's all the time we have. Thank you. <clears throat>